I'm, I'm Andre Ford. I'm the executive administrator for the Colors Organization. And it is my honor to introduce our panelists for today, Zachary Robinson. Zachary Robinson has worked in the field of HIV for the last 30 years. She is currently the director of long-term housing for the city of Philadelphia. She is also the chair of the University of Pennsylvania Center for AIDS Research Community Advisory Zachary also serves as the treasurer of the National CFAR CAB Coalition and is responsible for train, which is responsible for training community advisory boards throughout the country. The CFAR is the Center for AIDS Research, and there are not, if I'm not mistaken, there are 18 CFARs in the United States. She is also the beat. HIV Martin Delancey Collaboratory Community Advisory Board. She's a member of that and that's at the Wistar Institute at the University of Pennsylvania. I also had the pleasure of introducing Elijah Puskowski, who is a native of Philadelphia. In 2007, Elijah started his career at Mazzoni Center as a housing counselor. Over the time, Elijah has transitioned into program management for the housing for the Mazzoni Center. And it is a pleasure to have him here talking about uh, the agency supporting housing uh, services throughout the city of Philadelphia. We also have the pleasure, or I also have the pleasure of introducing, and you have also the pleasure of hearing from Ms. Ilana Alandra, Roberson, who is 57 years old and is li living life to its fullest. Always up for laughs, loves to watch comedy videos and spends time with those closest to her. She's counting herself blessed to have a family of two daughters and two grandkids and a church family who see, she meets with regularly. It is my pleasure to introduce the three panelists and we will get started with Ms. Robinson. Ms. Robinson, you have the floor. Hello, my name is Daphne Robinson, and I'm the Director of Long-Term Housing for the Office of Homeless Services for the City of Philadelphia. And my presentation today is going to talk to you about some long-term housing options for seniors. Let me share my screen and we can get started. Some of the key points and objectives that I would like to reach talk to you about today is the homeless system, age restricted assisted living, the Philadelphia Housing Authority senior residences, housing for veterans, which is also called HUD bash and senior complexes. The homeless system. In Philadelphia, we have a homeless system that consists of a coordinated entry progress it's called Seabreeze. Anyone who is homeless must enter this system through an intake process at one of our intake sites, either called the Apple Tree Family Center or Roosevelt Darby, both who you can look up under the Office of Homeless Services and see where they're located. Once you go through the system and do an intake, you are then placed in shelter. And I know that a lot of people don't wanna to go to shelter, but shelter is the first place to start to be eligible for our housing um, opportunities. It is extremely important to give true and honest answers about what you are being asked because your answers could affect your housing matches. A match places you with a program that can best suit your housing needs. For long-term housing, supportive housing, you have to have a disability. So any of the questions that they ask you, please be honest and truthful. Your match could be to a program that offers a one bedroom unit or a single room occupancy location. Please remember that housing stock is limited at times and may take a long time to get exactly what you're looking for. But also be mindful that if you have enough money, you are always welcome to rent in the fair market to get your own unit, your own place without having to come through our system. Our system are, is for those who are homeless, who have no residence at all. Your answers could determine if you get supportive housing. There's another program called rapid rehousing where you are giving a rental subsidy 
up to 12 months that will help you to get into an apartment or a unit. And then after that, the expectation is that you will be able to continue to pay the rent on your own without any additional subsidy. Some of the biggest mistakes that I've seen that is made, especially with seniors, and this is not a knock on seniors, but this is something that I find that we're really dealing with in our system, not giving truthful information that can hold up um, your housing choices, your names on your social security and ID cards not matching. In the case of getting um, housing with the Philadelphia Housing Authority, those two things must match to a T. Not keeping appointments with housing providers as requested. Several providers will do their own intake. Once we've you come through our system, they will do their own intake. And at that time, they're gonna want you to bring documents as well as answer additional questions for their programming. Not wanting to answer questions about disabilities or health issues you may have. These things are important because again, to get the long-term and supportive housing that we offer through the homeless system, you must have a disability. Age-restricted assisted living, nursing homes or personal care homes. If you are of a certain age, you may be eligible for age-restricted programs. Some programs only take participants up to the age of 62. Other programs take you as young as 55. Ensure that if you are seeking housing based on your age, make sure it is a fit for you and that you fit the criteria and the eligibility. If you have a case manager that is working with you, have them to help you. It's okay if you wanna do things on your own, but if you don't understand the application process or the eligibility criteria, please, please, please link to a case manager or someone that can help you. You may need to move into a personal care home if you are not able to effectively take care of yourself. Again, this is where a case manager can help you get assessments you may need from the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, they may need a documentation like a MA-51 form, which is required in order for you to get into a nursing home or a personal care for home that needs to be filled out by a doctor. Please work with your case manager. A nursing home may also be a needed option as well. Nursing homes are not like they used to be. They're, again, this is where you would do your research. It says you can choose and visit these programs to see if they are a fit for you, but you have to work with your case manager to see what your options are. Nursing homes and personal care homes, we understand that there's always been stories that we've heard about these things, but this is where, again, your case manager can help you and you can research the best fit for you. The Philadelphia Housing Authority, senior residences. The Philadelphia Housing Authority has several programs that provide housing for seniors. Now, this is where, again, a case manager is very important. Some programs that house seniors do not come with a, a refrigerator in the residence. So one of the greatest questions you can ask when you are being assigned to one of their properties is, does the property come with all appliances, including a refrigerator? Other, other complexes only provide housing in their own senior complexes. So if housing authority has a couple of senior complexes, you may get housing there. Another program may provide you with public housing where you're living in a housing authority, public housing site. It's important to ask questions about the type of housing you are receiving and are you receiving all of the appliances in that property. Housing for veterans. Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing, it's known as VASH, is a program where veterans can get the supportive housing and case management to help them become successful. The program can be assessed if you are a veteran and meet the eligibility criteria. A veteran can link with their case manager at the VA hospital or other veteran centers to, um, within the city to find out more about HUD VASH. It is a subsidy, so therefore they may look at your income, and that's why income information is also very, very important, because not only is income information important to see if you're eligible, because there may be an income limit, 
But income is also important because again, they need your income to do rent calculation. If you get SSI, SSDI, let us know. It's important to let people know. Also, if you get a pension, that affects your rental assistance. If you don't let us know about your rental assistance and how much, if you don't let us know about your income and how much it is for us to do a rental calculation, it could be considered fraud with these federal programs and therefore you might be kicked out of the program and never allowed back in. So please be mindful of that. We understand that people don't like to give up a lot of information, but these are some of the documents and information that we definitely need. Senior complexes. You can apply to, to any senior complex or any program that you choose. In doing so, you might wanna look for a location and that has access to markets, transportation, your doctors and pharmacy? Is it in a location where there's high crime, high drug use? Is it in a location where you're looking for a quiet neighborhood? It, it's up to you. Senior complexes may be expensive. Some may be expensive on one hand, but they also offer several amenities such as medical or physical therapy on site, a hairdresser or barber, programs and trips, swimming pools and exercise rooms. Seniors are living a lot longer. You all are living a lot longer. So there is just additional amenities for you to have a best, better quality of life. Your home should tell the story of who you are and be a collection of what you love. So again, thank you so very much for allowing me to speak to you again today on some very important tips and you have a great day. Good morning. My name is Elijah Prestikowski. I am the Assistant Care Services Director at Mazzoni Center. I use he, him pronouns, and I am here today to talk a little bit about Mazzoni Center's housing subsidy program and the work that we do here. Mazzoni Center offers housing support through the HOPWA program. HOPWA is an acronym for Housing Opportunities for People with AIDS, and it is funded through HUD. The program was created in 1992 as a response to the unique needs of folks living with HIV and AIDS. The program is housed in the Office of Community Planning and Development. In fiscal year 2021, the budget requested about $387 million for the HOPWA program. That's nationally. Research certainly demonstrates that housing remains the greatest unmet service need of individuals living with HIV and annually HAPWA serves roughly 55,000 households with housing assistance and an additional 50,000 households with supportive services. This slide talks a little bit about HAPWA funding and more specifically HAPWA modernization. Historically, HAPWA funding has been based on cumulative AIDS cases. And what that means is that larger metropolitan areas such as Philadelphia, New York, and Los Angeles for example, that saw large numbers of HIV cases early on in the epidemic, they were receiving a large amount of HOPWA dollars. This was problematic because some of the smaller, more rural areas, especially in the South, that were seeing um, current large increases of HIV and AIDS, um, they weren't getting funding to support those numbers. So in 2016, Public Law 114-201 enacted HAPWA modernization. With this, funding formula is now based on people living with HIV and AIDS instead of cumulative AIDS cases. Modernization also incorporated local housing costs and poverty rates into the formula. So as funding becomes more equitably based on living HIV cases, rural and southern states and communities are experiencing funding gains because of the modernized HAPWA formula. So this is amazing because it's, it's supporting folks in real time. What this did mean is that some of the larger metropolitan areas such as Philadelphia that were um, getting funding based on cumulative AIDS cases, they did see a decrease in funding. And between changes in the HOPWA formula and a shift in funding that was moved from Philadelphia to Philadelphia from other metropolitan areas several years ago, Philadelphia's funding was gradually reduced by roughly $2 million over a five-year period. And we are kind of at the tail end of that reduction, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we're leveling out at this point. 
In this slide, we'll talk a little bit about HOPLA locally and what it looks like in action in the city of Philadelphia. In fiscal year 2021, Philadelphia expended $6.5 million on the HOPLA program. Currently, the eligible metropolitan areas are Delaware and Philadelphia counties. HOPLA provides funding for tenant-based rental assistance, which is known as TBRA, and Direct Emergency Financial Assistance, or the EFA program, which supports individuals with payments towards back rent and utilities. Currently, locally, HOPLA, it, with the HOPLA program, homelessness is prioritized. And HOPLA is managed through a collaborative partnership with several local agencies. This includes Philadelphia's Division of Housing and Community Development. They are the grantee. They receive funds directly from HUD um, and distribute them to the HOPLA providers in the region. The Office of Homeless Services currently manages the HOPLA waitlist and refers eligible folks to the provider agencies. And those provider agencies are Mazzoni, Congresso, Action Wellness, Tenant Union Representative Network, and Family Services of Delaware County. In previous slides, we've talked about HOPLA funding, how it's determined, and what HOPLA looks like locally in terms of funding and referral distribution. In this slide, we'll talk a little bit more about Mazzoni Center's HOPLA program to hopefully provide some more informative information. So our program was established in 2003, and we started with funding to provide support for up to 30 households. Currently, we are funded to support up to 160 households with subsidized rental assistance. Our program is considered permanent housing, so there is no limit on participation. If folks are familiar with the Section 8 program, I would like to say that our program oper operates very similar to that. We are a referral-based program, so unfortunately we cannot accept applications for housing support. And in Philadelphia, folks being referred to the HOPLA program have, are, are mostly coming through the Office of Homeless Services because homelessness is prioritized. So what that means is that folks being referred um, have been homeless. They've come in contact with the Office of Homeless Services through a shelter or the street outreach team. They are assessed and then we are we receive the referral when we have vacancies um, and we have to confirm their eligibility for our program. So under our program, clients pay no more than 30% of their household income towards rent and utilities. Clients are able to choose their own properties. So we support them in finding private rental units throughout the city of Philadelphia or Delaware County. Um, once a unit is located, the HAPWA um, housing counselor goes out and completes an HQS inspection on the property. With these inspections, we're just trying to assure that clients are living in safe, um, sanitary units that are really supportive of their overall health needs. So those inspections happen before a client can move in, and then they happen again annually as part of the recertification process. And then once a client is housed, we provide monthly um, rental, direct rental assistance to them um, paying the landlord directly, but we also provide ongoing housing counseling services. So, and I think that's really one of the key components that makes our program successful. Um, unlike some other programs where folks are housed and then really expected to do it on their own, um, with our program, they're able to have a housing counselor with them for the duration of time on the subsidy, helping them make sure that they do what's necessary to keep their housing. Um, sometimes that, often that's working collaboratively with the client's care team to make sure that all of their needs are being met. So working with medical case managers, working with um, doctors, um, and, and other support therapists that the clients have in place. And, and that could look like support around substance use referrals, um, mental health referrals, um, medical adherence, supporting clients with applying for and accessing low income utility programs so that their bills are affordable and they don't face shut off, navigating tenant landlord issues, um, supporting clients who unfortunately miss rental payments and establishing payment 
payment plans with the landlords and making sure they adhere to those plans. Um, and I, again, I think that the housing counseling piece is really a key component in making sure that folks are able to, once they're housed, they're able to remain housed. Um, in the previous slide, we talked a little bit about our regular TBRA HOPWA program. Um, and this slide will talk about a program that was created specifically in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and that's the Mazzoni Center's COVID-19 Rental Assistance Program. This program was funded through the CARES Act. And with this program, we were able to provide 24 months of rental assistance to folks living in Philadelphia and Delaware County who are HIV positive and who experienced a loss of income during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the funds really tried to target a group of folks um, that couldn't receive support um, from other programs and assist them to prevent homelessness. I think we had our first participant start getting rental assistance in July in 2020. So it started a couple months after the pandemic began to really affect um, the United States. With the program, folks were eligible for even back rent payments. So it covered back to the beginning of the pandemic, um, which is when most folks um, experienced the loss of income. So folks really struggled after the pandemic began. Um, folks were laid off and really struggled to pay rent. Under this program, participants are, were responsible to pay roughly 30% of their household income towards rent, um, and the program covered the remainder. Clients had to be living in, again, private rental housing, and it had to be at or below the fair market value set by HUD. There was a little bit of flexibility with this, um, but in most cases, folks were at or below the fair market rent. Um, the program is winding down in we expect it to end or the last participant to receive final payment by May 31st, 2023. In all, we've supported over, um, I think, cl close to 35 clients with uh, subsidized rental assistance. Um, we paid a bunch of back rent. So we were, this program definitely had a significant impact on HIV positive folks living in the city in preventing homelessness and really helping give them that that little cushion or bump needed to help them remain in their housing during during the pandemic. So I, I think that this program um, has left an amazing footprint. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to sit with me and hear about the work that we're doing here at the Mazzoni Center um, and, and our HAPO programming. I will be available to answer any questions that you may have during the questions portion of our panel discussion. Um, and again, thank you for your time. My name is Lenanda Roberson, and I've gotten my services, or I have my services with Action Wellness. My counselor is Chad Spencer, housing specialist, I mean, who's really, he works really well with me. Uh, I'm on the housing program. I've been on the housing program for a number of years. And I find it to be very resourceful and very helpful. At one time I was employed and they accommodated it where I paid a portion of my rent according to my income, which was very helpful for me to maintain. And when I lost my job, when I was unemployed, they made it feasible, it made it very possible for me to have my rent paid in total, in full. I really appreciate that. They talk to the landlord, they get in touch with the landlord, any type of paperwork, affidavits that need to be signed in a timely manner is done. They work with me with the um, responsibilities of what the client's responsibility is and what the housing specialist uh, responsibilities are, and we meet those responsibilities every week. And um, it's just a wonderful program to deal with with housing because they understand the situation, the, the housing specialists. And with the program being designed the way it is, everyone has a chance 
to help one another. Like I help my housing specialist and he helps me in a lot of, you know, in a number of ways because we've established a relationship. He asks me certain questions about what the need is and what do I need from him and whatever it is I need. He's always prompt, always there and able always to assist me with whatever needs I have. If I had to give advice or to give advice to someone in the same situation as I am utilizing the housing program, it's just to, to be honest and let your housing specialist know what exactly you're going through financially with your feelings, emotions, you know, or mental stability or your physical. Let them know, be honest with them because the resources that they have can pretty much cover any need that, that we have. I also would advise that you try to stay compliant with whatever your responsibilities are. It's, they're not really major. It's like paying your rent on time, you know, calling in every two weeks or every couple of days or whatever, depending on the status of the relationship. I also would advise that you keep your landlord a three-way relationship with your landlord and be honest with your landlord so that your landlord can go with, to your housing specialist and they can work something out for you if there's any type of difficulties or anything arise. Everybody just be on the same page. I would advise also that you utilize your housing specialist to talk about stressors because they are not therapists or anything of that nature, but they are so concerned about our well-being, being action wellness. They they are very concerned about our well-being, and our mental status is a major major issue when it comes to housing and you know communicating with your housing specialist. So be honest, be consistent, and just keep it moving. That's all I can say. Keep it moving. Utilize your program. Follow the rules and the regulations that they have. You know, stay with what's easy for you by communicating. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm getting ready to uh, ask the questions in which everyone has put in for us to ask. I'm gonna start off with Zachary. Zachary, what is considered a disability through the housing program? Well, according to HUD, if you're gonna get permanent supportive housing, the disability could be a physical disability, it can be a mental health issue, it could be substance abuse, HIV AIDS. So that's why it's very important to make sure that when you're asked those questions about your health, that you do answer them fully. Um, you don't necessarily need to have disability income uh, because you could possibly be a zero renter or in the process of getting an application done for you around um, social security. But the main thing is those are the disabilities that HUD, you know, HUD gives a listing of different disabilities, physical, mental health, substance abuse, HIV, AIDS. So please make sure, again, if they ask you questions about that, answer those questions honestly. All right, thank you for that. Elijah, can seniors, can senior homes discriminate if you are an openly gay person? No, I, I would wanna say the answer is no. I would definitely, anyone facing discrimination, um, I would refer them out to either human relations of city of Philadelphia human relations commission. Um, we've also worked with, um, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but there's another legal service um, that we've worked with around income discrimination that I would also refer folks over to that to support with that. So the answer would be no. Okay. Thank you. Uh, question, uh, it's a statement I believe to, did I say your name right, Alana? Alani. Say it again. You're on mute. Lananda. Lananda. I'm, yes. Uh, someone made a statement saying housing specialists are concerned about our well being. I was not aware that the program was so comprehensive. Would you yes. agree with that? I do agree. I do agree. 
because it's the relationship that you establish and the people that are working as housing specialists in the organization with the program, they are such loving and caring and compassionate people. So guess what? It all works out. That's good. I like the fact that you said honesty. Be honest about your situation. Yes. I have another question for Elijah. And this was, was the full budget for HAPA HAPA funded? If so, how much? Yep, I would have to do a little research and get back to you. Um, I don't know what, how much from the CARES Act um, or all of the legislation around COVID has been redirected. Um, so I could do a little research and then maybe send something out so that folks could be updated. Oh, Hi, this is you. Keith Andre. I think the question really was, did you receive your full funding budget from this funding budget? Yeah. You know what that's going to be for the year, the full funding budget. So yeah. here, yes, yeah, so we, we were funded um, in, in full in fiscal year 2021. So, Zachary, what if you are waiting for disability determinations? Can you apply through a homeless shelter? Yes, income has nothing to do with you getting into the homeless system. It's only when it comes to rent calculation. And sometimes some programs, depending on, you know, we have providers that have their own building. So if they get something like a low income housing tax credit for their building, that may have a eligibility of income and income cap. But again, that's where you would get all that information from that provider. But to get into the homeless system, there is no income eligibility. Okay. I have a question uh, for Elijah. Does or can HAPA support any first time home buyers program? So we don't have funding to directly support, but um, our funders, DHCD, um, they do offer first time home buyer programs. And we have had, um, at least in the last five years, I think roughly five participants who came off of the HAPA program and went into home ownership. Um, so, but to answer your question, we, we don't directly fund that, but we can um, help folks explore their options and provide referrals. Do, let, let me follow up with a question to that. Is, is this other program able to assist them with their mortgage payments? Yes, um, uh, with move-in costs, and that's through the city's general um, first-time home buyer programs with the city of Philadelphia, and that supports usually with up to ten. It was up to ten thousand dollars. I'm not sure if, yeah. if that's still the level. Mm -hmm. So I have a statement here uh, from Chad. From what I understand, and and either, any one of you can 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 uh, fill into this comment. From what I understand, a disability to determination per HUD can be made by any medical professional capable of diagnosing the condition. It is not contingent on social security determining the disability or any particular agency. Um, uh, can you comment on this or expound on what uh, Chad yeah, that is, that is true. That is true. A doctor can make the determination and there are forms for that. And the, and the funny thing is, is that during COVID, a lot of the disability um, determination was done by either self-report or if the case manager knew the person had a disability as documentation for disability. That waiver from HUD just ended March 31st. So now people have to start again getting the forms from the provider or whoever, get the doctor to fill it out and to prove that they have that disability. Thank you. Uh, anybody else want to comment on that? Uh -oh. <laughs> Elijah? Okay. Uh, any advice for people trying to get into senior housing and encounter long wait a long wait list. You know, for even, even for us, that's an issue or problem. Um, I think it's just the nature of the beast. And as soon as you find some place you might like, get on that list. They may call you and tell you to give them documentation. Get the documentation in as soon as you have as soon as you get it. And it may be a waiting game. We have some people that's still been on Section 8 lists 
who are just getting their Section 8 certificate and they've been on for eight, nine years. So you never know. So what is the average wait? wait? For senior programs, it could be anywhere from maybe two to three years. And I have to be honest because, you know, once you find a good spot, folks are not leaving. It's the same thing with the permanent supportive housing. When people find a good place, you know, a, a one bedroom unit or whatever, it they don't leave. They don't leave because if it's a good spot, they keep it. And some people may pass away in the program. That's why HUD is working on what's called a move on strategy with people who may not necessarily be as vulnerable as they were when they first started can move on to something else that they can afford and that sort of thing. So that way that slot is opened up for somebody who's more vulnerable. Can anybody, can you, can this, uh, can the AIDS law project help in any process to expedite or help in assisting them with uh, getting on the program? I don't understand your question. Someone asked, uh, I'll, I'll make sure I'm reading this one. No, that's a comment. Somebody made a comment about you can reach out to an AIDS law project. Is that correct to assist? Oh, you mean with the housing of discrimination? Yes. Was that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That yeah. was me. That was me. Um, yeah, right. AIDS right. law project, also fair housing. Okay. Uh, last question. What does DHCD stand for? Yep. So that's the Division of Housing and Community Development. Can you expound on that? Sure. So that's a city program. Um, they're located at 1234 Market Street. They also have a housing. We're pre-COVID. We have a housing advisory committee meeting that takes place bi-monthly um, that consumers are certainly welcome to talk about Hopla in the city of Philadelphia. Um, but yes, it's the division, Philadelphia's Division of Housing and Community Development. I believe, thank you, everyone. I know that we're, I think we're on time. If not, we're a few minutes short, but thank you for your participation and supporting the program. Thank you very much.